wondering why I have different colors on my robe. This robe is 15 years old. I use it every day. And it's starting to get old. And we had to replace the panel and we didn't have the same color. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Uh, how many people here have practiced meditation? Can anybody here give me a definition of what meditation is? Yeah. It's stealing the mind, quieting the mind. It's quieting the mind. That's part of it. Anybody else? Nobody is brave enough? Practicing concentration. Practicing concentration. That's part of it. Reducing thought or encouraging awareness. Okay, I'm going to give you a definition. Meditation is... Oh, I was just about ready to give another definition. Meditation is watching how mind's attention moves from one thing to another and seeing that as an impersonal process. Okay, that sounds like a lot. And I'll explain it in just a moment. There's basically two kinds of meditation that are being taught in the world. 95 or 98 percent of the meditation that's being taught is a one-pointed absorption kind of meditation. I don't teach that kind. I teach a serenity insight kind of meditation. I also teach you to laugh and smile very much. Now, what's the difference between absorption concentration and serenity insight meditation? Now, most people, when they're practicing meditation, their mind is on the object of meditation. I don't care whether if you're looking at a candle or you're using your breath or you're practicing a mantra, whatever that happens to be. Your mind is on your object of meditation and there is a distraction. The distraction can be a sound or thoughts, whatever. When you're practicing absorption concentration, you let go of that distraction and immediately come back to your object of meditation. Is that the way most of you are practicing? Okay. This is an absorption kind of concentration. I also call it one-pointedness. What happens when you do that, and you start to go deep into your practice, your mind starts to focus very deeply just on one thing. And what happens after that is you start experiencing very strong uh, tranquility, a lot of peace, that sort of thing. If somebody comes and walks into the room and makes a noise, it makes you startled. Now, with the one-pointed concentration, what happens when you're doing this is the force of the concentration stops things from arising when you get to a certain level. Now the things that it stops from arising, in Buddhism we call these hindrances. There's five hindrances. Lust, <coughs> I want it mind. Hatred, aversion, I don't want it mind. Sleepiness and dullness, Restlessness and anxiety and doubt. 
these five hindrances, when they arise, they stop you from meditating. That's why they're called hindrances. Okay? When you practice one-pointed concentration, the force of the concentration stops these from arising. So your mind doesn't have any distraction in it. Now, what is the difference between what I'm showing you right now and this one-pointed concentration? The serenity meditation, your mind is on your object of meditation and it gets distracted. Same. You let go of the distraction. That's the same. Now you add one extra step in your meditation and that is releasing the tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. When you relax that tension and tightness in your mind and in your body, you are letting go of what the Buddha called craving. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. By adding this one extra step in your meditation, it changes your entire meditation. It stops from going like this to being a more and more aware of everything else that's around you. Now, I know these kind of meditations very intimately. I've been practicing meditation for 35 years. And the first 20 years, I was practicing a form of one-pointed concentration. When I was told to do the meditation, they never mentioned anything about the tension and tightness that happens in your mind and in your body. And you see me keep on going like this. In your brain, you have two lobes. Everybody knows this. Ed. Now there's a membrane that goes around each lobe. And where these membranes come together, they get stuck. And that's what you can call attachment. When you practice, let's say, mindfulness of breathing, you're told, put your attention on your nostril tip or your upper lip or put your attention on your abdomen. It doesn't matter where they say to put it. But you focus very deeply just on the sensation of the breath. When the Buddha started talking, uh, started teaching the meditation, he gave very clear instructions. And the last part of the instructions are the key to the Buddha's meditation. The first sentence of the instructions, it says, When the meditator breathes in long, he understands he breathes in long. And when he breathes out long, he understands I breathe out long. The second, it says, you understand when you breathe in short, and you understand when you breathe out short. Now this is the instructions that the Buddha gave. This is the breathing mindfulness of breathing practice. Did you hear me say nostril tip, upper lip, following the breath all the way in and all the way out, or abdomen? No, because that's not in the instruction. The key word in the instruction right here is you understand. That means you know when you take a long breath and when you take a short breath. You know when it's fast and when it's slow. You know when it's deep and when it's shallow. You know what the breath is doing, but it doesn't say focus on the breath. The actual part of the meditation comes now. 
That was the preliminary part. It says he trains thus. He's talking to monks when he says this. That's why he said he. The meditator trains thus. On the in-breath, you experience the entire body. Does it say body of breath? The entire physical body. On the out-breath, you experience the entire physical body. Now this is the interesting one. You, you, the meditator trains thus. I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation. I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the bodily formation. What does that mean? Now, when I was in Asia, the bodily formation was very clear to people, from the top of your head down. I come back to this country and people tell me that their body is from here down, and mind is from here up. But that's not true. This is part of your body too. Now, getting back to the brain and how this works. that with this membrane that comes around your brain, every time there is any kind of disturbance, a sound, a thought, a sensation that arises in the body, any time there is something that pulls your mind away from your object of meditation, this contracts and you're so used to it having a contraction around your brain that you don't really notice it. Everybody here has tightness in their head right now and they don't notice it. You have to intentionally look for this tightness and relax it. When you do that, you'll find that your mind becomes exceptionally clear, exceptionally bright and pure. Why is that? Because that tension and tightness in your head around your brain is craving. <coughs> and you need to be able to recognize this craving. When you let go of the tension and tightness in your head, you feel your mind, you feel the, the tension release, and there's kind of an expanded feeling. It's very pleasant, actually. And then you notice that you don't have any thoughts. You don't have any distractions. You just have this pure mind, and you bring that mind back to your object of meditation. So, this is a very important step to add to your meditation. And a lot of people, they kind of grumble and say, well, I've doing this meditation for so long. That means I'm doing it wrong if I didn't have this extra step. No, you were just doing this other kind of meditation and I'm trying to encourage you to try relaxing the tension and tightness and see what happens for yourself. Now, we have... Oh, right, I'll finish with the instructions. On the in-breath, you tranquilize a bodily formation, tightness around your brain. On the out-breath, you tranquilize your bodily formation, the tightness around your brain. Any kind of distraction that pulls your mind away from the breath and relaxing, then you let go of that distraction. How do you let go of a distraction? Say it's a thought. How do you let go of a thought? By pushing it away? By trying to force it to stop? That doesn't work. 
you notice that your mind is thinking this or that. The content of the thought doesn't matter. You don't keep your attention on that. You let that thought be there and think itself. Now you relax the tension and tightness caused by that thought. And you're going to love this one. I teach people to smile. When you're sitting in meditation, I want you to smile. And you need to bring up a smile and come back to the breath and relax it. And repeating this over and over again. What's the big deal about a smile? Well, there's a lot of tests that are being done right now on smiling and laughing. They're finding out that there's all kinds of wonderful things that happen in your body and in your mind when you do this. Years and years ago, there was a test, I think it was the University of Minnesota. I'm not sure on that, but it, it's been so long ago I can't remember positively. That they did a test on the corners of your mouth. When the corners of your mouth go down, so does your mental state. When the corners of your mouth go up, so does your mental state. What's the point of learning the meditation? Where you're frowning, you're creating tightness in your mind and in your body. What's the point of doing that? That's exactly the opposite of what you want from the meditation. You want this to happen. You want to be able to let go of things. I teach loving-kindness meditation. Loving-kindness meditation is very interesting because you're radiating a, a happy feeling for someone else. And I'll explain that in a bit. I tell everyone that the meditation is a smiling meditation. And an interesting thing about meditation is that it's not just about sitting like a rock without moving. Meditation is watching how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. Now, when you add a smile into this, you start to develop a habit of having a light mind. And eventually, joy starts arising. Okay, so you want to do, that's nice to have joy every now and then. But joy is a mental factor that's really important in your daily life as well as in your sitting. When you have joy in your mind, your mind is very uplifted and your mind is very alert and your mind is very agile. So you can see when you start to have thoughts that pull that feeling down and you get caught in the mud. So the more you develop having an uplifted mind, the easier it is to recognize when you're getting caught by an attachment. What is an attachment? An attachment is any kind of thought or sensation that arises that you take personally. What do I mean by take it personally? You're sitting or you're walking around and all of a sudden you get angry. Whose anger is that? It's mine. I'm mad. I don't like this. Did you ask that anger to arise? Is it yours really? Or is it because conditions were right to have anger arise? 
What you do with what happens in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. This is karma. Any time you try to fight with the truth, the truth is when I'm angry, I'm angry. Right? Anger is there. That's the truth. Any time you try to control the truth, any time you try to make the truth be anything other than it is, you can look forward to a lot of suffering. Why? because I'm mad. Who's mad? I am. Who's mad? Whose anger is it? It's mine. And it hurts. Now, somebody says something to you and you have anger arise. And then you take their anger and you make it your anger and then you throw it back at them. Now you're at war. You're fighting. And you start saying something that at the same time that this other person is, ta is talking to you. You don't hear what they say because you're paying attention to what you say. Now this goes on for a little while and eventually they leave. What happens in your mind? What do you think about what they said, what I said, what I should have said? I'm right. They're wrong. And a little while later, just like it's on a tape deck, same thoughts, same order, same words. Now, when you have anger and you are identifying with that anger and you're thinking about what they said and what you said and all the rest, and you get into a car and you start to drive, are you driving? How do you think accidents happen? Because you're not paying attention to what you're doing while you're doing it because you're thinking about something else and your mind is a thousand miles away and you're not really paying attention. Now I'm going to give you a definition for compassion. Compassion is seeing another person in pain, allowing them to have their own pain, Give them the space to have their own pain. And love them unconditionally. So, somebody comes up to you and they're angry. And they start saying things that are rather hurtful. You can take that pain, make it your pain and throw it back and be at war. Or not, it's your choice. When you start to look at somebody else that's angry, you start to see how much pain they are experiencing. You know what it's like to be angry. Your blood pressure gets up and you get red in the face. Sometimes you even get black, you get so angry. And all of your muscles are tense and tight. And you're not really conscious of the things that you're saying. And later you wish, oh, I shouldn't have said that to that person. That was really me. But it's already gone. Now you have guilt on top of it. Now, when you see somebody else is angry, and you recognize them as being suffering the way they are, and you allow them the space to be angry, but you don't pay attention to what they're saying because it's all rubbish anyway. You start sending them kind and loving thoughts. It takes two to tango, it takes two to fight. 
If there's only one person fighting, that fight goes away pretty quickly. Then one of two things will happen. Either they will walk away shaking their head grumbling, and you know how painful that is, or they'll settle down and you can start discussing what the problem is. Either way, when they walk away, your mind is alert. Your mind is ready for whatever else there is that's going to happen. When you hold on to your anger that you've been fighting with, going back and forth, the next person you see, what do you talk about? What a turkey that person was. How much you dislike them. How much you disagree with them. And that tight mind is incredibly painful. Everybody you see the rest of the day, you start going, leave me alone. I'm in a bad mood. I don't want to be doing any of this stuff. Believe me. And you, you're not very compassionate towards anybody else, especially yourself. And then you get home at night and you tell everybody in your family, bad day, don't want to talk, leave me alone. I just want to go lay down and go to bed. But your sleep isn't very good. You wind up tossing and turning. And then you wake up the next day groggy. Now, there you can hold a grudge because of some anger for quite a while. I knew one lady that could hold a grudge for two weeks. She made everybody else around her suffer because she held a grudge because of something that happened two weeks ago. When you add this extra step of relaxing and letting go of that tension and tightness, and you get this mind that's very bright and very clear and pure, and you come back and smile, and you stay with your object of meditation when you're doing your daily activity, it's whatever you're doing at the time. But the smile is absolutely important. The more you can smile into what you're doing, the more uplifted your mind becomes. The more uplifted your mind becomes, the easier it is to recognize when it gets pulled down, and you won't get caught for as long. See, the Buddha was very much interested in teaching uh, universal truths. And one of the universal truths that he taught is called right effort. Right effort is this. There's four parts. Recognizing when your mind has an unwholesome state in it. Letting go of that unwholesome state and relaxing. Bringing up a wholesome state. What's a wholesome state? Smiling. And if you're sitting in meditation, your object of meditation, and keeping that meditation, keeping your mind smiling all the time, or as much as you can. The Buddha was very much interested in showing us how to have an uplifted mind all the time. Now there's a word that is going around, and it has been for as long as I've been meditating, and it's used a lot with a lot of different teachers. Be mindful. Okay. What's it mean? 
What's it mean to be mindful? We all use the word. We've all heard the word, right? What's it mean? <coughs> Excuse me. Being mindful means remembering to observe how mind's attention goes from one thing to another. That's mindfulness. It's remembering to observe. It doesn't have anything with anything to do with changing anything or making anything different. It's just observing. Now, you're sitting and all of a sudden sadness arises. Did you ask that sadness to arise? No. It came up because it was time for it to come up. Conditions were right for it to come up. There is an attachment there. Now, the question with meditation is not why did this sadness arise? We don't care about the content of a feeling when it arises. Or an emotion, I should say. What we're doing is we're starting to observe how your mind went from being on your object of meditation to being sad. How did that happen? Not why did it happen not getting involved in trying to control, not trying to force anything away. This is just observing this. I was over here and now I'm over there. How did that occur? Now, we're made up of five different things. We have a physical body. We have feeling. I'm not talking about emotion. Feeling is a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. That's all it is. Then we have perception. Perception is the part of the mind that <coughs> names things. You look at this and your mind says, that's, that's cut. That's a glass. That part of your mind that named it is perception. It also has memory involved with it. You have thoughts and you have consciousness. Now, when a painful feeling arises, it doesn't matter whether it's a physical painful feeling or a mental painful feeling. Our habit is to try to think the feeling away. I don't like this sadness or this pain, physical sensation. I don't like it. I don't want it to be there. Every thought about the feeling makes the feeling bigger and more intense. Today, we have an amazing amount of people in our culture that's taking drugs for depression. How does depression work? A painful feeling arises. There's the perception of that painful feeling, the naming of it, and then there's these thoughts. God, I wish it would stop. I really hate this feeling when it comes up. Why doesn't it just go away and leave me alone? Now, the more you have thoughts about that feeling, the bigger and more intense that feeling becomes until it turns it into an emergency and you can't stand it and you need to do something about it. What our culture says right now is take drugs. That's what you need. And then you walk around spaced out for a little while because you took some drugs that have these side effects that aren't really very nice. Rather than to look at how this process works, 
the feeling arose. Right after the feeling, there is craving, tension and tightness. This is the I like it, I don't like it mind. When it's a pleasant feeling, I like it. When it's an unpleasant feeling, I don't like it. But it's this tightness. Right after that, we have what arises is called clinging. Clinging is all of your thoughts, all of your opinions, all of your ideas, all of your concepts, all of your stories about why you don't like that feeling. Right after that, you have your habitual tendency. Every time this kind of feeling arises, I have these thoughts, I always treat it in the same way. And then you have a birth of action and trying to push away. And then you have sorrow and lamentation and pain and grief and despair. And that's suffering. Why does this arise like that? Because that's the true nature of everyone's mind. And what our habitual tendency is, is to try to think feelings. The feelings are one thing, and thoughts are something else. Never the two shall meet. So what do we do? We have this painful feeling, we have this craving arise, we have all of these thoughts about it. The first thing you do is you let the thoughts you don't keep your attention on the content of the thoughts. You let those thoughts be there by themselves. Then you'll notice that there's a tight mental fist wrapped around that feeling. It's a painful feeling and I don't like it. Okay, it's a painful feeling. But the truth is, when a painful feeling arises, it's there. That's the truth. Anytime you try to control the truth, make the truth be anything other than it is, any, you try to change the truth, you can look forward to more and more suffering. That feeling gets bigger and more intense because you're trying to control a feeling with thoughts. And you're trying to control your concepts about that feeling and how it's yours and you don't like it with this clinging. So you need to allow the space for that painful feeling to be there. It's all right for that painful feeling to be there. It has to be all right because that's the truth. Now you see this tension and tightness in your head, in your mind, and in your body. And you relax. Now you bring up a smile and come back to your object of meditation. If you're sitting in loving kindness or mindfulness of breathing, whatever, it doesn't matter. And stay with that. This process works for everybody in the world. If you're a human being, it works for everybody in exactly the same way. That was one of the real revelations that I have. Please don't sit like that. This is one of the revelations I had when I was in Asia. It's not Asian. Everybody's mind works the same way. Isn't that odd? We're human beings. There is no difference. Painful feeling arises, craving arises, clinging arises, habitual tendency arises, birth of action arises, and all of the pain and sorrow and lamentation arises after that. 
how do you let go of this process? How do you let go of this pain? By allowing the space for that pain to be there without resisting it. You see, the Buddha found out something that was really, really important. And that is you need to lovingly accept what arises in the present moment. It doesn't matter whether it's painful or not. And that means letting go of that tension and tightness in your head and in your mind. Now, when people are practicing absorption concentration or one-pointed concentration, Let's say I have a ball in my hand, or somebody throws me a ball, that's better, and I catch it. And I let it go. That's like letting go of the clinging, all of your thoughts and opinions. But there's still tension, holding this hand up. That is like letting go of the craving. So how do you do that? How do you let go of craving? First you have to recognize what it is and where it is. It always manifests here. When you get into the habit of relaxing the tension and tightness, all of the tension in the rest of your body starts to disappear. Okay. Sounds pretty good so far, huh? <laughs> now, one of the reasons that I really like to, to teach loving-kindness meditation is because the smiling is so very important. You have to put a little bit of smile while you're sitting. But the smile is not only here. The smile is in your eyes. You'd be surprised how much tension you hold in your eyes. And you let that go and smile with your eyes. You smile with your mind. You smile with your heart. Okay, it's not just this. Although this, even when you don't feel like smiling and you smile, has definite advantages to it. This is stupid. I'm not going to smile. <laughs> now there's another part of this. And that is when you have a real attachment, really angry at somebody, if you see how attached your mind is and how dumb it is to be attached to this anger that's not even yours, and you laugh with yourself, you go from, I'm mad and I don't like it, to, it's only this anger. You see the difference? I am that, it's only that. Okay? When you laugh at how crazy your mind can be, welcome to the human race, we all crazy. <laughs> and it's okay to be crazy. When you laugh, it changes your perspective from a personal perspective, I am that, to an impersonal perspective, it's only that. And nobody wants to really hold on to that kind of an unwholesome state. So you go, okay, we'll let it go. We don't need that one. I've had students that have come to me and they were going through heavy duty emotional stuff and they come crying and it's not, it doesn't matter whether it's man or woman, they come crying <coughs> and they're, they're nervous are anxious and oh this is a most terrible thing and I say well okay why don't you smile into it I'm not gonna do that <laughs> and you know their suffering and their attachment to that 
makes me laugh. And when I start laughing, then they start laughing, and all of a sudden they're not attached to it anymore. They've let go of that suffering. They've let go of that pain. We need to have this uplifted mind. This is really important. Now, I've gone to a lot of meditation retreats. I've done, oh, I think it's, it's somewhere between 12 and 15. I really honestly don't know the number because it's not important enough to remember. Three-month retreats. I did an eight-month retreat. This is silent retreat. I did a two-year retreat. The only person that I ever talked to was the teacher. I didn't talk to anybody else. When I started noticing that people are practicing meditation and you see them sitting very tight-jawed, frowning, I go up to them and I go, anybody home? <laughs> Don't do that. Why are you causing yourself all of this suffering? Why are you trying so hard? See, this stuff is simple. You smile more, you laugh more, you have this uplifted mind, you have a mind that's really alert and life starts to be more and more fun. The kind of meditation that I'm showing you right now has this relaxed step in it. And when you use that relaxed step over and over again, you are letting go of the craving the cause of the suffering. You see, uh, all through the store here, you see a hand that's going like this. That's the Buddha's hand. And sometimes there's an emblem in it, sometimes there's not. But when they're going like this, what the Buddha was talking about is there is suffering. There is suffering in life. Does anybody not agree with that? So this is a universal truth. There is suffering. He didn't focus on the suffering. He just stated, yeah, sometimes it's tough. There's a cause of suffering. What's the cause of suffering? Craving. That tension and tightness in your head and in your mind. And when you relax that, the third noble truth is there is the cessation of craving. And the fourth noble truth, there's a way to practice. Every time you smile, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. Every time you let go of that craving, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. Simple. This stuff is simple. I didn't say it was easy. There is a difference. Especially when you have an attachment. Now, I told you before about the five hindrances that arise. The greedy mind, the, the aversion mind, the sleep, dull mind, sleepy mind, restless mind, anxious mind, doubtful mind. These arise because in our past we broke precepts. What are the precepts? The first precept is I undertake to abstain from killing or harming living beings on purpose. 
I undertake the precept to abstain from taking what is not given. I undertake the precept to abstain from wrong sexual activity. That needs a little discussion. We'll get to it in a minute. I undertake the precept to abstain from telling lies. Slandering, which means dividing one group from another. This is the one that, this next one is very important because I hear it so much on TV, you can't see a, you can't see a movie without it happening, you can't listen to the radio without it happening, and people walk around cursing all the time. You abstain from cursing. Why? What kind of mind are you developing when you curse? An aversion mind. You start using speech that is very pleasant and kind and refrain from cursing. And the last part of this precept is you abstain from gossip. What's gossip? Talking about somebody when they're not there and making up stories about them. The last one, there's going to be some resistance. <laughs> not taking any drugs or alcohol. Ah, but a glass of wine, that's okay. No, it's not. Dulge your brain. I can tell you, I have 2,000 students or 3,000 students. I have no idea how many people I've taught. And when they come into the first interview, I can tell you whether they drink alcohol or not, or they take drugs. I can tell you right at that very moment when they come walking in, because their mind's dull. Distracted. Now, these five precepts, and I'll get to the sexual precept in just a moment, these five precepts are not commandments. There's nobody in heaven that's going to fire thunderbolts at you if you break them. But you know when you break a precept and it causes disturbance in your mind. The closer you can keep the precepts, the less troublesome hindrances will arise. Okay? They're attached. Hindrances and precepts are attached. Now, the sexual and, uh, precept, not having any sexual activity with another person's mate. Not cheating on your own mate. Not having any sexual activity with someone that's too young. They're still under the care of their parents or guardians. Not having any sexual activity with prostitutes, people that do that for a living. What it comes down to is not having any sexual activity that will cause anybody else around pain or suffering. And the Buddha said, we have to follow the laws of the country we're in. I lived in Malaysia for a lot of years. Muslims can have four wives why anybody would want four wives is beyond me. <laughs> but they can do it. And it's okay. They're not breaking that precept. But in this country, it's not allowed. Okay? I'm not saying that you can't have sexual activity unless you're married. I'm not saying that. That's your choice but having sexual activity that doesn't cause anybody else around you to, to have pain and suffering. That's being wise. Now, the hindrances are something that we've all broken, and we all have kind of a guilty feeling because of that, 
and then we have things like fear and anxiety arising very often. Why is that? When you kill another being on purpose, you're doing that from anger. You're doing that from hatred. And I'm talking about mosquitoes and cockroaches and ants and uh, if you come and visit in Missouri, you'll get to be real familiar with chiggers, ticks, leeches. <coughs> I don't care what it is. Don't kill on purpose. If you do, when you sit in meditation, you will have fear arise. That's one of the side effects of breaking that precept. You'll have anxiety arise. You break the precept of not taking anything that's not given. How do you feel when you steal, when somebody steals something from you? Why do you want to do that to anybody else? And when, if you in fact do steal from someone else, what happens is whatever you stole disappears very quickly. You don't really get the enjoyment out of it that you could if you hadn't done it. So all of these things cause a guilty feeling to arise in your mind. Now the most important precept really is a speech precept. It's real easy to say something that's not true. A little white lie here and there never hurt anybody. Yeah, it does. It hurts you. And your mind will say, I shouldn't have said that. That's not right. It's a little quiet voice that says it. And you just shove it off. And then you sit in meditation and your mind just runs all over the place. And you have this anxiety and you have this restlessness that's really a painful feeling. And you have to go through that to purify your mind from breaking that precept. So it's better to say nothing sometimes than it is to say something that's not true. I know, I'm talking about morality can't help it because it affects your meditation directly. Makes me end up when I smile. I can't feel any heart. I, no feeling. This stuff doesn't work. I'm going to go back to the mindfulness of breathing. <coughs> so I finally said enough. I don't want you to sit for seven days. Don't sit in meditation. All I want you to do is smile all the time. And when it's difficult to smile, then I want you to laugh. <laughs> Simple. So I didn't hear, him, hear from him for seven days. And I'm starting to think, well, He's gone. <laughs> and he writes back to me and he said, I took your advice very seriously. And I started smiling. And you know, these are some of the observations I had. I was always walking around in a mental haze. And I walked with my shoulders down and my head down and never looked around. And when I started smiling, my posture changed. And I started looking around, and you know one of the darndest things? When I smile at somebody, they smile back. Nobody ever smiles at me. And he said, even when I don't feel like smiling, I smile and I feel a lightness happen. He said, people are starting to come up and actually talk to me when I'm smiling. And they're coming close. This is amazing stuff. And then he said, and the doctors stopped giving me such heavy medicine. <laughs> 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 
And I went, doctors? <laughs> Wait a minute. Why are they giving you medicine? Well, I'm in a mental institute. Oh, gee. It would have been nice if he told me before that. And I wrote back and I said, okay, you're starting to see all this advantage of smiling. Do you notice that your mindfulness is any different? He said, oh, yeah. I have happiness coming up in my mind. I have this really strange feeling. I, it might be joy. So I wrote back and started questioning him about what was happening in, with him in the mental institute. Why was he there? And he said, well, I'm actually a pretty heavy-duty bipolar personality. I have these high highs. I have these really dreadful lows. And I said, okay, now what I want you to do is practice loving kindness meditation and wishing yourself happiness and feeling that wish and then sending that wish to yourself and to send it to someone else of the same sex. I'll tell you why in a minute. So he started doing it. Now he, we were on the Yahoo group at the time. And our Yahoo group is very much different than most other Yahoo groups. When they're talking about spiritual things, everybody starts arguing with each other and there's all kinds of anger and all that. This doesn't happen in our group. This is a teaching Yahoo group. And if you have a problem, you come out and you say, I've got this problem. There might be a half a dozen people that have had the same problem. They start writing back saying, you know, I tried this and it really worked. So it's kind of a fun group. <coughs> And he started reading the Yahoo group every day and somebody would come up with a problem. And he'd say, now I don't know what the answer is, but I experienced that with this meditation. And this is how I overcame the problem. And he was telling them brilliant things. Absolutely brilliant. Now this is after one week of doing nothing but smiling. His understanding became so strong Oh, he was told when he went in that he was going to be in the mental institute for the rest of his life. Six or seven months later, they had taken him off of a lot of drugs, and they saw that he was capable of living by himself. So they let him go. Now, he had a girlfriend and he was engaged to get married. And right after he got out, his girlfriend said, I'm not going to marry you. I'm going to marry this other guy. Now, she was a pretty heavy, <coughs> depressed person most of the time, too. And he's writing to me, and what am I supposed to do about this? And I'm saying, well, just forgive her. She's not understanding what's happening. Three days later, she committed suicide. He really cracked. He's, he's at home now, but he's really, really depressed. It's understandable. He said, I went and told the doctor what happened, and he gave me these really heavy drugs. But when I take these really heavy drugs, the side effect is so bad that I'm just all I do is sit and stare at things. So I told him that there is a part of loving kindness that is very important, and that is forgiving. And especially with anybody that cuts their life off, they, it's the, one of the more selfish acts that can happen, and it makes everybody sad around them, so you have to forgive them for not understanding how much pain they're causing themselves and everybody else. And the way you do the forgiveness meditation is you forgive yourself for not understanding. You forgive yourself 
for making a mistake. You forgive yourself for causing pain to anyone else. You forgive yourself for not being perfect. And there's four wishes right there. You stay with one wish for a while. I forgive myself for not understanding. And then a thought or memory comes up. And what happened for him was the memory of his girlfriend came up. And I said, okay, now you have to forgive her. In your mind's eye, you have to look her in the eye. And you have to sincerely mean it. I forgive you for not understanding. I forgive you for causing this pain. I forgive you completely. And you stay with that for a while. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. And then you hear them say back to you, I forgive you too. So now you've completed the circle. You've forgiven yourself. You forgave this other person that caused this pain. They forgave you. Now he did that. And he was doing that and writing to me after every time he sat, which was fairly often. And I could see that he was starting to pull out of it a little bit, and then he would crash again. And then he would pull out of it a little bit, and we would have our discussions about the things he was going through and how he could soften into that. He didn't feel like smiling. It's real hard to smile when something like that happens. But he can have a loving mind. It took almost a week. And finally one day he wrote to me and he said, I really forgave her. I have all these memories of her, but they, they aren't painful anymore. What did he do? He went from, I'm sad, I don't like this situation, I should kill myself, to, it's only that. And it's okay for that to be there. It has to be, because it's the truth. He went through a grieving process. It took about two weeks, actually, because it would, he would still have his ups and downs. But after two weeks, he got on the internet, and all of a sudden he's telling people, you know, I just went through hell and I can smile. If I can do it. Anybody. <laughs> He's really amazing. The whole thing with meditation is don't believe a word that I've said. Try. Try smiling for a week and see what happens. Try laughing every time you get serious about something. See what happens. What happens in your own mind? Now, there's a lot of people that are really interested and they say, we want peace in the world. How are you going to do that? You've got to start with number one. If you can't be, be peaceful in yourself and you can't project that peace to other people, there's never going to be any peace in the world. Joy is an amazing mental state. There's something that the Buddha said that's very relevant. He said, whatever you think and ponder on, that's the inclination of your mind. You think and ponder on what a turkey this person is, your mind is going to think and ponder on that. You're going to tend to think about that person and not like that person because you're holding a grip. On the other hand, if you think and ponder on smiling and having an uplifted mind and wishing other people happiness, what's your mind going to tend towards? 
towards being happy, towards having this uplifted mind. And when you have joy in your mind, your mind is really quick to recognize when that goes away. And it's such a pleasant feeling that you go, no, 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 we're not going to play that game. I don't need to cause myself this pain. I'd rather be happy. <clears throat> now, when you do this over a period of time, you start getting equanimity in your mind. What is equanimity? Very strong balance. Instead of having the roller coaster ride, I like this, I don't like that. I like this, I don't like that. It starts to be like waves. Yeah, you're still going to go through tough, tough times. What, two months ago, my mother died. That was not particularly a happy experience. But I didn't push away the pain. I let the pain come. Because it was the truth. It was there. And the more you allow the truth to be, the more balance you have in your life. It's up to you whether you do this or not. It's your choice to be happy or to suffer. You can't blame anybody else for your unhappiness. You cause it to yourself by resisting the present moment and fighting with it and trying to change the present moment and be different than it is. There is a way to let it go. Smile. Relax. Now there was a real interesting thing that happened. My family doesn't get along with each other. Okay? They're really nasty to each other. I mean, incredibly so. So I had to make up my mind before I went into that situation. I didn't care what they said to me or said about me. They can have that and I can be happy no matter what. I can't take their pain away, but I can be happy. And because I was happy, after a while they stopped fighting with each other. And a little bit later, they actually started laughing with each other. And that started from my example. You want the world to be a fun, peaceful place? Don't talk about it. Be the example. The more you smile, the more you laugh, the more fun you have and the way you tell whether you're progressing spiritually or not is by your sense of humor. You start laughing with things. You hear somebody say something that's so true that it's unbelievable. You're going to laugh. It makes you happy to hear this stuff. And you're not laughing at anything. You're not laughing at anyone. You're laughing because it makes you feel good. It makes your body healthy. It makes your mind feel good. <coughs> and you're affecting the world around you in a positive way. How do you like your traffic jams? What happens in your mind when you're in a traffic jam? Are you observing how your mind attention moves from being happy to being unhappy? I, I love these people that have road rage. How ridiculous is that? You see people, you see their face all screwed up and they're, they, they're red in the face. You cut me off. So? Didn't see you, sorry. 
See, that's when you start noticing that you have equanimity. You have more balance in your mind. You don't get on that dislike and grab onto it and say, this is me and I'm going to do something about it. Say, ah, oh, never mind. It doesn't matter. <coughs> it really doesn't matter. The Thai have a say, my been right. Never mind. Let it go. It's more fun to have fun. It's more fun to be happy. So, don't believe me? Try it. Try it for one day. Just make up your mind when you get up in the morning that I'm going to have one of the best days of my life. And smile. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says to you. Let it be and radiate your loving kindness to them and smile and laugh. Just one day. See what it's like. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I'd rather be angry. I'd rather cause myself suffering and pain. Okay. You can do that. It's your choice. It doesn't matter. I'm not here to teach you anything. I am a guide. And if you get off the path, I'll come along and say, well, let's get back on this one. It's more fun this way. It's more fun to, to laugh. Life isn't supposed to be serious. Worry, anxiety. Whoa, the economy. I've lost so much money. So what? You want it to come back? Uplifted mind. I travel all over the world. I don't have any money. I don't need any money. I go to Japan. I'm going to Europe in two, two or three days. And people, they say, <coughs> come. They're saying, come, come, so much that I'm getting pulled in all different kinds of directions. Why? Because I'm a good guy. <laughs> I'll say, oh, you, look, look at what you're doing over here. Why are you doing that to yourself? You don't need to do that. Come on, let's have some fun. Let's smile more. Let's be happy. When you take care of the truth, the truth will take care of you. I can give you a perfect example of that. I was a layman. I got a job where I made exactly $100 a week. I got a place uh, with some friends and I gave them $50 a week for a room and board. I didn't need much there. And this was way back when, when I was a layman. And I was working in a nursing home and this one lady, she had a disease where her brain was shrinking. And she, she her, her memory was almost completely gone. And I thought that she would really uh, benefit from having some acupuncture and try to open up the, the energies. And I went to the, the family and I said, I want to take her and get her acupuncture points. Is that, get her acupuncture, is that okay? And they said, fine, you can do that, but we ain't gonna pay for it. And I said, I don't care. So I paid $35 a week for her treatment. I gave my mother $10 a week. I gave a monastery $10 a week, added up, $105. I only made $100. That's all the money I ever had. 
and every time I put my hand in my pocket, I had money. How did that happen? Because I was giving to other people all the time. I wasn't worried about having money. When I give to other people, I'm taken care of. I needed to go drive 35 miles away and somebody came up to me, they didn't know what I was doing. But it was kind of an emergency thing that I had to go. And they said, you know, I'm not going to use my car this weekend. Do you want to use it? Okay. That saved a lot of problems. If you take care of the truth, the truth takes care of you. If you worry, that's an unwholesome state, isn't it? And the more you worry, the more anxiety you have, the more poverty conscious you become. When you stop worrying about it and you start spending your time saying th things that make up other people happy, doing things for other people that make them happy, thinking positive thoughts about everybody around you, you'll be taken care of. Money is nothing but funny, funny looking paper. It's nothing. Like I said, I go to Japan, I, I have people in Korea that are crying for me to come there. Yeah, we'll pay for you to come there, please come. <coughs> so, you want to travel around the world? Don't worry about where the money's coming from. Do things that make you <coughs> everybody else around you have. <laughs> Practice your generosity in all different kinds of ways. You will be taken care of. I made the mistake one time of going to Australia coldest day of the year, shortest day of the year. Cold. I came from Malaysia. Hot. I didn't have any socks. I didn't have a sweater. I didn't have anything to keep me warm. And I started thinking, boy, it would it would be a heavenly realm if I could just get a pair of socks so my feet weren't so cold. By the next week, I had a dozen pair of socks. People were giving me socks, <coughs> right? And I can't turn it off. People keep giving me socks. <laughs> and I'm walking around going, I have enough socks. I don't need any more socks. Last year, somebody gave me 24 pairs of socks. What in the world am I going to do with that? I can only use one or two pairs at the most. So I wind up giving it away. And what you give away, you get back. <laughs> How long is this talk supposed to be? <laughs> okay, I've been talking for a long time. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So, my conclusion is it makes sense. The question I have a little confusing is if your time comes to your mark and if you let it be, so when is that you have to say it's enough? When do you have to say it's enough and? Because if your if your mind comes up, if the pain comes up, if whatever is going on, so then. Well, but you can't do that with what's happening in the present moment because it's going to stay as long as it's going to stay. There are no controls. Okay. Now, when you practice meditation and you follow the directions, and I highly recommend that little blue book that, that's back there. It will talk about sitting in meditation, and when you sit, 
you don't move. And you have an itch arise or a pain arise here or there or heat or vibration or something like that that's unpleasant. What you do normally when that arises is you start doing this. Now what I want you to do is see how your mind moved from being with your object to meditation over to that sensation. And then you start noticing the pattern that starts happening. The thoughts about it. I wish it would stop. It's really uncomfortable. And the more you think, the more it occurs. Now, if you let go of the thought, you relax. You see that tight mental fist around that sensation. You relax and allow that sensation to be there. Now, you smile and you come back to wishing loving kindness to someone else. But the nature of these kind of sensations is they don't go away right away, so your mind goes back to it. So, you get to do the same thing again. And again, and again, and again. And every time you allow that to be and relax, you are improving your awareness of how this process works. And then you start seeing right before I really got into this itch and started thinking about it pretty heavy, there's something that happened right before that. So you let go and you relax and smile and come back. And then the next time your mind gets pulled to it, you notice that thing again. And right there, you let go and relax and smile and come back. And you start spending more time on your object of meditation and less time on the distraction. Now, either this sensation will go away or it won't. If it doesn't go away, your mind will gain such balance with it that it doesn't even pull your attention to it. Then you just ignore it. But if it goes away, you will feel some real relief. And then you feel joy arising. And then after the joy, you feel very peaceful and calm. And you feel more comfortable in your mind and body than you've ever felt before. Your mind stays on your object of meditation very nicely. That's the first stage of your progress in the meditation. So that's how it works. You're not trying to control anything. And that's, that's a hard one. Because we always think we're in control and we're not. Anybody else? Is there a way you can, I can become a member of the Yahoo group? Yes. Can you give him one of our business cards? Yeah. Do you have to write to her and tell her, give her some of your history? Uh, if you go to the, if you go to the, um, the first, uh, the Dumb Google website, on the first page there is uh, a, a link oh, okay. over to the Yahoo group, oh. and then it explains to you what to do. You just write to me and tell me that you were at the talk and that you wanted to get in there. But don't, don't write me and don't say anything, because I'll dump it, because I don't let people in there that solicit or have a suspicious email and I don't know why they're coming in. We're, it's a very controlled membership, you know, that's in there. We don't bother each other and we, we talk a lot just about the meditation. It's not a discussion group, it's a, it's a support group so that you have access to us as teachers. It's fun. <laughs> it's it around, is. It's been around you for... You wind up <coughs> getting up in the morning and I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Well, maybe I'll check and see what, we <laughs> say, what they said on the Yahoo group. And it's, it's real fun because it's not only a learning experience, but you get to know some of the other people that, that write 
the answers and you can if you want to sometimes we can get into some pretty deep subjects on how things work and sometimes we have online retreats where you can just go to work and have the online retreat and those are cool they um, they're a week long and you make a commitment to do the precepts and the refuges in the morning and then to sit two times a day and listen to one Dhamma talk a day. You get rid of your newspapers, your your radio, uh, television. magazines, television, turn it all off. But you keep going to work, doing whatever you're doing. And you keep running your meditation all day long. You keep see? smiling. And every day you have to write us a letter and we have to reply uh, to your uh, interview. We will reply to whatever you right. say. To what to whatever you're writing, you ask a question questions as you go what along. Your was. And we've had up to 15 people in seven time zones doing that, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of a fiasco. But we ask you to tell us which day of the retreat you're writing to us about, so we can keep track of which Dharma talk you're referring to as you go along. It's kind of fun. When when you talk about the physical tension up here, yeah. When you talk about releasing that, is that a physical? It's a physical yeah. feeling of expansion when you it, it just. So it's a focus on yeah. feeling the tension and letting it go. It's a recognizing that it's there and letting it go. But it's recordable on an EEG, and you can learn to feel that sensation. Mm. You can be trained to learn when that is happening. That release point. And the easiest way to, <laughs> to recognize that is to practice smile. It's really amazing when you practice smiling, how much tension you hold that you didn't even recognize that you were holding it before. It's funny. I have an aunt who always smiled, and my mother would say. She had electroshock treatment. She didn't want to smile like that. So ever since then, I always thought, you know, don't walk around with a smile. <laughs>